Good evening. My name is Lindsay Hamill and I'm the Associate Director of Education at UCR Arts. And this is Third Thursday Talks. Before we um, the program starts, we at UCR Arts would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air. The Kawia, Gabrielino Tongva, Luceno, and Serrano peoples and all of their ancestors, descendants, and descendants past, present, and future. Today, this meeting places home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, and staff, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. Today's third Thursday talk is a conversation about the intersection of photography and jazz and this exhibition currently on view at UCR Arts. Jazz Greats, classic photographs from the Bank of America collection has been loaned through the Bank of America Art in Our Communities program. The Bank of America in Art in Our Communities program was established in 2009 to share the company's art collection with the widest possible audience. Comprising the art collections of prede the predecessor banks that are now part of Bank of America, the program offers museums and nonprofit galleries the opportunity to borrow exhibitions at no cost. Since 2009, more than 140 exhibitions have been loaned through this one of a kind program. UCR Arts would like to thank Bank of America for the opportunity to present this exhibition and their dedicated team for their valuable assistance. We would also like to thank the Marjorie and Glenn Memorial Fund for supporting Third Thursday Talks. Our speakers today are Douglas McCullough, Senior Curator here at the California Museum of Photography, and Joshua Welchez, Jazz Ensembles Director at University of California, Riverside. Doug has curated CMP exhibitions since 2004, mo most recently Facing Fire, Art Wildfire, and the End of Nature in the New West, which will travel to four Southwest US venues starting in 2022, starting this year. <laughs> and his curatorial practice frequently features under-recognized and emerging artists and the themes that connect them. Examples include Sight Unseen, the first major survey of photography by blind artists originating um, at the CMP and traveling to multiple venues, and in the Sunshine of Neglect, the first survey of experimental photography originated on the margins of Los Angeles. Doug has shown his own um, system-driven photo-based projects in over 250 national and international exhibitions and has publications that include six books and numerous catalogs. He holds an MFA from Claremont Graduate University. Joshua Welches is in his 10th year at UC Riverside directing the jazz, jazz ensemble and combo, as well as teaching classes in jazz theory and arranging. Outside of teaching, he's a trumpet player and has performed or recorded in the jazz genre with Anthony Wilson, the Gerald Wilson Jazz Orchestra, the Claire Fisher Big Band, Carl Denson, John C. Riley, and Larry Goldings. Most recently, the Larry with Larry on the soundtrack to Netflix's Self Made, inspired by the life of Madam C.J. Walker. Outside of jazz, Josh has performed or recorded with the Dave Matthews Band, the Freestyle Fellowship, Syl Johnson, and Breakestra. Josh and Doug, thank you for being here and leading us through um, some select photos in this exhibition. Um, if anyone in the audience has questions for either of them, feel free to put that in the chat or the Q&A box and we'll get, the, get to those at the end of the program. Um, and I'll go ahead and share our first image and hand it over to both of you. Oh, and we're out of time. Oh. <laughs> I know. You're just both so impressive. We had to go through. Um, so, Doug, I have obviously a lot that I could I could say about these musicians. Um, I would, for myself, love to hear um, about the anything that you know that could be said about the the image itself. Yeah, I know this is this is such an interesting um, subject in the sense that we have photographs that we're looking at, but the subject in the photograph is so powerful. It's jazz and truly great jazz artists. So we we commonly look past a flat object. We'll take something out of our wallet and say, "This is my grandmother." It really isn't your grandmother. It's a little. It's a photograph, right? But you know, in this case, jazz sort of takes over. I mean, I'll I'll throw in comments about the photographs, but I would love to hear from you about, in, in this case, you know, Ella Fitzgerald and Dizzy sure. Gillespie and Ray Brown, and I, and I'll just sort of throw things in about the photographers when, around the edges. Sure, and and we have three um, 
photos from the same evening, you know, probably taken seconds apart um, from different angles, which is, which is cool, which is interesting. Um, so yes, the, the, the singer that we're looking at is Ella Fitzgerald. Um, and she, uh, I, there's, I mean, she's just a legend um, in, in music. Uh, Ella Fitzgerald, um, she had a, a rough, rough childhood. And um, there's kind of this legendary uh, thing to her, to her beginnings in music. Um, she actually wanted to be a dancer. And um, at the famous Apollo Theater uh, in, in New York City in, in Harlem on, I think it's on 125th Street, they have an amateur night, which is um, just supposed to be like a real cutthroat thing. And they they pull people off the stage with a cane and the audience boos people. And she went up when she was, I think, 16 or 17 years old um, to dance for this amateur evening. And um, she was intimidated by a dance troupe that went on right before her. And at the last second, she decided to sing instead and sang two, um, two different tunes. And she won the whole evening. Um, and she was supposed to become a featured uh, performer. And I think because of, uh, you know, her, her look, she, she was poor. She, um, you know, she was a teenager at the time, didn't have any money of her own. And they didn't, they didn't do that. But that did kind of give her the start to her career um, after that she began uh, working with Chick Webb, who was a, a famous drummer. Um, and he, she was kind of his featured singer. He ended up dying. This was in the late thirties. He died, I think in 1939 and she took over his band and um, she led that band probably for six or seven years, um, which is kind of unheard of at the time. Um, she has no, as far as I know, she has no musical, like formal, formal musical training, but I mean, there is, there's really nobody like her. There's nobody like any of these musicians that we're looking at. They were all just individual artists. My, I would call all of them geniuses, musical geniuses. She, um, she kind of started doing these kind of cutesy tunes. She's well known for, um, a Tisket, a Tasket. She wrote her own arrangement for that. It was on a movie. Um, and then you see in the background, there's, there's Dizzy Gillespie, um, you know, kind of staring at her fondly um, as she, as she's singing. Um, this is Dizzy Gillespie's big band that's, that's on the stage there. Um, and she is, uh, you know, if you look closely, you can see she's holding a purse. She's got a nice hat on and uh, she's not sweaty despite the fact that there's a stage light right there um and those are very hot stage lights uh and so what i see here is that she was a she was a patron of this of this club and was invited up as a special guest now she did sing with dizzy gillespie's big band um formally but this the fact that she's holding her purse and that he put his trumpet down he's kind of giving her the, you know, the, the spotlight, so to speak, um, for the, you know, for the time she probably got up and it's what we call sitting, we call it sitting in. She's, she's sitting in as a guest, probably on two or three tunes, maybe just one. Um, and, and the thing that that's so amazing um, that we'll see in this video is that she, um, she, with no formal training, she is able to, to, emulate the the horn players like dizzy gillespie um she's not the first person to do what's called scat singing that that would have been louis armstrong but she's the first person to do it and actually sound like one of the one of the horn players she can she can um mimic the the intricate harmonies that they play um and she does this all by ear and i i don't know for a fact but i would be surprised if she knew the music theory behind everything that she did the, the rest of us have to spend our whole lives learning how to do that and and she does it by by ear um, a quick um, a quick comment about the photographer there's sort of a weird parallel story about about how he got into shooting jazz his name's william gottlieb there's quite a number of photos in in this exhibition by him and we'll look at some others um he started he was working as a young man, I think 20, in the advertising department, kind of as a grunt at the Washington Post in Washington. And, but he was really into jazz as a young man. 
And so he wanted to go to the jazz column. He, he talked the Washington Post into allowing him to write a weekly jazz column and just persuaded them. And then he thought, well, I need photos to go along with it. So the, can we get a photographer signed? They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't even pay. He, he bought his own camera. He bought his own wow. film. He went to these clubs. He wrote a weekly jazz column for the Washington Post as a kid, basically, and started shooting photos. He was so poor that he couldn't really afford much film. So he would wait for the perfect moment and like shoot one shot, maybe two. But because he was doing it on his own, he kept all his own negatives. They didn't own the photos. He owned the photos. And from there, eventually he moved to New York. He worked for Downbeat. And in the end, he shot right through the golden age of jazz. I mean, amazing photos. And on top of it, he decided at the end of his life to place all his photos in the public domain. So, so they're some of the most well-known photos of jazz great. So, I mean, I love the fact that, you know, she goes into a, you know, a contest and sweeps it and he just starts on his own going to clubs and paying for his own film, buying his own camera. It's hilarious. Really. Yeah. That's a definitely like a kind of almost similar beginning. Yeah. You know? um, just an aside there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's her, that's her husband behind her. They were married. Um, I'm not sure for how long, I think it was somewhat brief. That's Ray Brown, who was just a, um, I mean, he, he's kind of just a huge figure in, in, in jazz bass. I mean, emulated today. The same thing goes for Dizzy Gillespie. Um, Dizzy Gillespie, I, I remember seeing an interview with him where he, he's, I mean, he's still the, you know, this picture was taken 75 years ago and he still to this day is, um, kind of the 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 model for for modern jazz trumpet playing i mean we still you know i'm a trumpet player and we still base the way we play on on the way he played that long ago i mean jazz prior to that time period you know jazz kind of came around in in the 1890s and the first jazz recording was 1917 so in the in when he came on the scene in the late 30s it was not very old and and there was just this amount of um of growth in the music and then even though there's been growth in the last 70 years, we still we still model ourselves after Dizzy Gillespie. Um, but he also called himself, besides an artist, he, he acknowledged that he was an entertainer and that not every jazz musician is like that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll probably talk about Miles Davis, too. And he was not like that at all. So, you know, in this video that we have um, coming up, Dizzy Gillespie's dancing, um, he's singing and uh, <clears throat> Um, before we show that video, I just want to kind of talk about it a, a little bit. Um, that's a video uh, that we'll see of, of his big band. Um, he was he was known um, as uh, what we would call uh, like a bebopper or a, a modernist. And his style, just the way he looked, was emulated. Um, and I, I read his autobiography um, years ago, but I, I remember he kind of jokes about it in the book where he says that he, you know, he was, he was known for wearing horn rim glasses, thick plastic glasses. And he would, um, he wore those, he says, everything was practical. You know, his glasses, his wire glasses would break when he put them in his pocket. So he got big plastic glasses. And, you know, when he goes into the club, he stopped wearing a fedora, which was popular in the forties. He switched to a beret so he could roll it up and put it in his pocket. And he has that little, you know, uh, trumpet player mustache, you know, underneath his lower lip because it helped him with the placement of his mouthpiece. And that look became like this beatnik look in, in the 50s. Like so many people looked like that, that were not jazz musicians. I've seen pictures, I saw a picture of, uh, of three teenage um, girls that were in this Dizzy Gillespie fan club and they were getting his autograph backstage. And they were all wearing like a like a Dizzy Gillespie getup. They had they had a fake, <laughs> you know, beard and the glasses and the beret and, and everything. <laughs> um, and so it, it started off as this kind of a, a subculture because these musicians were not, um, they, they were developing their music for artistic reasons. And um, it, they weren't looking at it necessarily as like a, a, an entertainment thing. And so um, part of it was like they were losing the older generations. A lot of the um, older musicians that were probably 10 years older didn't understand their music. So this, this song that we're about to see 
the lyrics are about that. There's like a, it's basically about like this, this older musician who thinks that he's hip, which means in the know, and he's not, he's making mistakes with this music and all that. And then after he sings, then Dizzy will play the trumpet. So we'll get an idea of what this modern, for the time period, modern sounding trumpet playing was. The guy who had some brand new tricks Played his horn on a crazy kick The thing that made him such a flop Was he beat Or when he should have bopped His hand will catch up right up on the stand But he couldn't seem to dig the band He thought he was the cream of a crop But he beat Or when he should have bopped All the cats gathered around To see what he was trying to prove but anyone could plainly see that he was dragging them out of the groove. At last the leader turned around and said, Listen, Pops, you had better stop, or there you go, you did it again. You just beat, or when you should have bopped. Okay, so um, I guess it would be a, probably a good time to go through the rest of the, the images from that, um, from that same evening. Uh, everybody that's, this is the same band that was on that video. So you see sitting behind Dizzy's uh, shoulder there, but the glasses is Milt Jackson. That was the, that was the man playing the, the vibraphone, um, the vibes on the video. Um, there's, there's Ray Brown again. But, and th uh, this is the the one that's in the exhibition is is cropped really tightly like this and is actually a variant. Um, her eyes are closed, but and Dizzy's a little you know doesn't have his hand against his cheek and so on. So this is the one we have. There's a quick sequence of these. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it kind of almost you know takes me to that time period, especially because we can see the video. Those were it's probably the same year. Um, but yeah, I just um, she's she's we have a we have a video of her of her as well but she was you know really the first to 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 scat that way um and in that in that video it begins with her as a you know probably 20 year old um and uh singing a tisket a tasket and then it goes into this um it's a long like a 10 minute long video which i you know i got down to a minute and a half or a minute or something and it's it was in about 1960 or so and she's singing um how high the moon which is a standard and she goes in and she starts scatting and it's really it's really amazing if um if folks want to look this video up themselves to see the whole thing she goes uh she does what's um what, what's it's not a cappella, but she it eventually it becomes just her and the drummer and she has all these musical cues where they where they kind of follow her and she does if you see the whole thing she quotes like the beatles who were out at the time, you know, so it must be a little later. It's probably 1964 or something like that. So she quotes the Beatles. She quotes all this musical theater, all this stuff. And then, and then she messes with the lyrics and the fact that she's able to take this song and not be, you know, and, and mess with the harmony of it and um, not have any kind of harmonic accompaniment, just drums. And she stays in the right key. I mean, th she's just an amazing, she was an amazing singer. There, there's a reason why we talk about her, you know, after, she's been gone for nearly 30 years so um yeah that's that's her and, and we're gonna uh the end of this video is uh in the 50s and 60s she started doing these um her manager got her to do these uh uh they called them songbook albums where she would take 
one composer and she would record an entire album or two of only that those and so the reason why I included it in the video is because it's a different side of her where she has like she can take a real beautiful sentimental ballad and still do something with that she's not like one you know one thing a multifaceted uh, musician that she was I dropped it, I dropped it, yes, on the way I dropped it, a little girly picked it up and put it in the pocket. To me soon, until you will, how still my heart, I the moon. Hi, hi, the moon is the name of this song. Hi, hi, the moon, though the words may be wrong, we're singing it. Because you asked for it, so we're swinging it just for you. So the words may be wrong to this song. We have to like hi, 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 Well, that was high, high, high. It's the moon, and I hope I'm still in tune. High, 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 high. <laughs> they asked me how I knew my true love was true. I have got to find something here inside. Sweat gets in my eyes. I, 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 That's just crazy genius. That is so wonderful. I mean, just to to, to command the uh, the musicians like that, you know, the the whole band and have them follow her. Um, I, I think we could go to the next slide or two. Um, and I and I think for these, uh, I think it would be okay to to save a little time and skip the the video um, for Fifty Second Street for Dizzy Gillespie, but we can talk about it. Um, yeah. So there's 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 a reason why he's standing in front of that uh, street sign um, in Manhattan. There was in the late forties up till about the mid 1950s, there was one block on 52nd street um, in New York city. That was um, a concentration of, of jazz clubs. Um, I believe at the time I've been down this street now and there are um, office buildings there. Um, New York is kind of known for demolishing old buildings and building new ones. Um, and that's one of the things here, despite the history, um, at the time there were brownstones there and there was a concentration of like seven or eight jazz clubs within one block. Um, in front of these brown brownstone stones, there would be like a big marquee and it would have just these legendary musicians and people could just crisscross the street and see like different, all these different um, genres within jazz you know they could see uh classic musicians from the 1920s that had you know had a resurgence and were playing they could see young musicians like dizzy gillespie miles davis all of these musicians were all playing and then they would play often with each other and they would meet other musicians and it's just a, a something that will never exist again hasn't ever existed anywhere else um in in los angeles nowadays 
we have a few um, we have a few different uh, jazz clubs. There's a good one next to LAX, and then I mean maybe in Pasadena or someplace that you know it's like there's miles between. And over here, you literally just had to cross the street. It's just an amazing thing. Um, so much so that um, there were songs written just about the street itself. Um, and so, yeah, someone asked about the person in the in the picture. I, I don't know who that is. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I, I don't know either. I have no idea. I will say that this is another William Gottlieb photo, just in the sense that he just hung out. He just hung out. I and mean, he was in New York and he loved jazz. And so he he's the one who was shooting the, the previous photo. So these wonderful, candid sort of moments, they're very real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the next slide, I think, is a picture of of actual of actually what it looked like so those are all jazz clubs um actually i don't think those are brownstones those are kind of just apartment buildings i guess but um all the clubs are in the basement um of all of those places uh yeah i just i can't imagine <laughs> what that would be like i have to you know i have to drive an hour or two just to see some live jazz and then that's it i'm committed i can't just go hey well who's playing across the street it just doesn't exist <laughs> anymore, you know? so i think we can we can move on i think there's yeah. um yeah i'll um th i'll do a little riff on on this photo this is really an oddball photograph in a way it's there's only one by Lisette Modell who's a very well-known photographer very influential as an educator and a photographer and I thought since this is a jazz thing I would just do a, a real fast kind of improvisational riff on based on this photo and on her influence in photography so as the caption says this is the singer at the Cafe Metropole in New York circa 1946 sometimes this photo is dated 1947 some of these are, you know, a little a little bit loose. Lisette Modell was born in Vienna around, I think, in 1901, and ended up leaving Europe um, ahead of the Nazis in the 30s with the family, and ended up in actually in California for a time. Taught in San Francisco for a year or two, was hired by Ansel Adams to teach at the San Francisco Academy of Art, um, and then moved to New York and worked as a photographer, shot photographs herself and taught at the new school. She had a very distinctive vision and really put a major stamp on photography, not just with her own photographs, but by teaching. There's a, a quote by Edward Steichen, who was the, who has a photo actually of George Gershwin in this exhibition. He's a photographer, but he was also the director of photography at the Museum of Modern Art immediately after World War II and up into the 60s, um, saying that Lisette Modell strikes swift and hard and sharp, and her work is devoid of all extraneous devices or exaggeration. She really delved into the kind of foibles of people, you know, the senselessness, their suffering, sometimes their greatness, but kind of this hard vision of a little bit of craziness. She had studied as a teenager in Vienna with Arnold Schoenberg, who was a family friend. She had wanted originally to be a musician before becoming, deciding she couldn't cut it, play piano. So I'll just click through some additional slides really quickly by a few of her students. Uh, just a couple of them. The, she had a long list of students. This is Larry Fink, who is still shooting photographs and studied with her fairly late. She taught from the, I think, 1951 up through the 80s, mid 80s. Um, and so he's still operational. He's known for these crazy square format um, photographs, a lot with on-camera flash and really detailed because they're medium format. Next slide. Um, he's also a jazz musician. He plays piano. He loves music. I mean, music is his major muse, even though he's famous as a photographer. Um, this is just a GQ party. Um, this is another photographer on the right, Peter Beard, in a party. I love these chaotic kind of, I mean, you can see a little bit of Lisette Modell's influence. You might recognize Barack Obama in the upper left running for president, but it's one of these Larry Fink on camera flash chaotic kind of 
people don't necessarily look their best. Um, all right, the next slide. This is a completely different photographer. People, if you know photography, probably know this photo. It's very famous. Deanne Arbus, um, probably the most famous student and an extremely influential photographer. This is, you know, called Identical Twins. Um, she really concentrated on kind of marginalized people, but she was friends with, she had relationships. You can see that it's not, she's not like Larry Fink shooting in a, in a party. So this is young man at home in curlers, New York City, um, Patriot with pin and flag, 1967. Most of these are in the 60s, transvestite at a drag ball, New York City. And that's in 1970. Um, uh, the next one is burlesque comedian, Atlantic City, 1963. This one, uh, she shot a whole series of these unnerving babies. This is actually Anderson Cooper. And he has, he owns two copies of this. The Diane Arbus has sold for a lot of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So he has one in his New York place and one in his uh, kind of other outside New York place. He was gonna get a third and hang them all together. He says, I don't mind people knowing that I'm the baby in one of these Diane Arbus ones. I just don't want people to think that the photograph I'm in is the child with the hand grenade, which is the next one. Um, <laughs> this is also another famous one. Um, you can see that the kind of hard edge and the avant-garde that influenced Lisette Modell in terms of Arnold Schoenberg introducing her to the avant-garde in Vienna in the, in the, when she was young in the 30s before they left. You can see it coming across. This is one of hers. In 1976, she went back through all her early work and put together a portfolio of 12 images. And so this is one, um, this is in 1934, man in front of a billboard in Paris, uh, 1934. This is probably her most famous photo, Coney Island bather. What's really interesting to me looking at these, you know, ref classic reflections Rockefeller Center is that she, I think, was influenced by her own whole career. She's looking back 40 years over her and picking really early work and putting together this portfolio of 12. So it's like her own trajectory influencing her and her students influencing her. So at that point, she's selecting photos. We'll look at another one. Uh, the next slide. Another quite famous one, a woman on the Lower East Side, woman with a veil. That's in San Francisco. So she, it's almost like the photographs reached back and redefined her own early work in order to put this portfolio together at, toward the end of her life in 1976, which finally gets back to the photo we started with that's in the show. And to me, I'm, I'm a collector of quotations and I love quotes. There's a Miles Davis quote, which I've always loved, which is sometimes you have to play a long time just to be able to play like yourself. And that's where like Lisette Modell, it's a whole lifetime in photography. And at the end of her life, she goes back and selects this set of 12 images influenced by her own life, but also by her students, by Diane Arbus and so on. And it connects to the miles, you know, it can take your whole lifetime to figure out how to play like yourself. So that's it on Lisette yeah. Modell, a little riff. <laughs> I mean that's really true. Um, as a, as jazz musicians, you know we we want to have our our own voice, and I'm 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 sure it's the same thing in 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 any art form, you know. And and we but we start by by emulating other people. So actually getting your own voice takes takes decades, right? And and you it know, takes a certain amount of being comfortable with exposing that who you are through your art. It's 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 not and when somebody like like Miles Davis, who's you know like Ella is just an insane genius says oh it, it takes a long time to figure out how to play like right. you go yeah, well okay that's probably true also the the one other quick comment as far as the connection a connection between photography and jazz is many people have commented on that photographers a lot of well-known photographers have been very inspired by jazz because of the improvisational you know cameras are grabbing that little moment out of the flow which is very much like responding in an improvisational way in jazz. And mm -hmm. so the connection is, is obvious, but is kind of 
you know, one that has influenced a lot of people. How do, how do I shoot photographs in the way that jet, people play jazz? I just think, and Lisette Modell was one. So, yeah. All right, we'll, we'll move on. Okay, so John Coltrane, that is his second wife uh, behind him. John Coltrane, uh, it's just, a, I, I, <laughs> there's not enough time to talk about John Coltrane. <laughs> Uh, just a, an innovator in, in music, died very young. Um, I believe he was 40 of um, liver cancer, if I remember, uh, in 1967, but um, played with the Dizzy Gillespie big band uh, early on, actually. Um, he was not in that, in that video or, or the photo, I don't think, but he was in that, in that band. But that is his second wife, Alice Coltrane, um, who was a huge influence on him. Um, she was a pianist. She also played harp, um, one, of, one of the few jazz harpists. Um, she, uh, I mean, she, she was such an influence on him. Actually, before that, she was married to, before John Coltrane, she was married to a singer, Kenny Haygood, who was a bebop singer who actually sang with the Dizzy Gillespie big band often. So there's all these connections. That was her, um, her first husband who um, she had a, a child with. Um, and then I think around 1961 or 62, she met John Coltrane. Um, they got married in 1965 and had three children. Uh, but she, her influence on him goes beyond music uh, to, um, to spirituality. Um, he's very well known for um, A Love Supreme, which um, uh, is, I, I believe it's like basically a four movement suite. Um, that he recorded with his with his quartet and one of those melodies uh i mean it's instrumental but but you can put these lyrics to it that he wrote which is like this um like a prayer basically and that was her influence on him um and after he died she played music she died i think she died about 12 to 15 years ago i don't i don't remember but she took um time off of music probably two decades um and was involved uh, in, in the Hindu religion, very much involved. Um, I think in, uh, opened up a, um, a center in Santa Monica um, and was like a figure in, 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 that, um, in that faith and just was a huge influence in the, towards the end of, of his life. And also they, they, had, um, they had three children together. Uh, two, who, uh, one, one was killed in a car accident about 40 years ago, but um, but uh, her son, Robbie Coltrane, is a, is a very famous saxophonist. Um, this, so, is, this is a photo by Charles Stewart, who's a, a, a black photographer who grew up, was born in Texas, but grew up in Tucson and has a little origin story really quickly. On, supposedly on his 13th birthday, he was given a, a Kodak camera. This is in 1940. And the next day, the well-known singer, Marian Anderson, famous black opera singer and singer in general uh, came to the school his school in Tucson and he took his camera and shot photos of her and got the film developed and sold photos uh, to his classmates and made a couple bucks so he became a professional photographer um, mm -hmm. the day after his 13th birthday wow. and in fact decided at that point to become a photographer at which point he wanted to go to a university program uh, there were very few photography programs in universities and only one in the country would accept black students so he went to ohio university and studied photography and became a, a totally great photographer of music and jazz mm -hmm. um i just love the story he's 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 a wonderful photographer um, and this is the playback of the love supreme sessions they're listening oh, okay. to the playback yeah yeah, so she's not, she doesn't play piano on that recording. She did record, I think, on his last two albums. Um, that was McCoy Tyner playing, but I mean, she, she was a very accomplished pianist um, and would have had, you know, very instructive things to add, um, which I'm sure, I mean, she's not, um, this, this is not like a Yoko Ono situation. <laughs> <laughs> she's in there as a, as a, as a you know, a contributor. Um, so I can't, I don't remember what the next slide is. Um, let's see. I don't know. Oh, yeah. So Eric Dolphy, I can talk about Eric Dolphy real quick. Um, Eric Dolphy is from Los Angeles. Uh, he's 
he was known as an primarily as an alto saxophonist. He, he of course, right there, he's holding a that's a bass clarinet. He was one of the first, um, really only uh, jazz doublers, what we call a doubler. He 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 played and recorded on the flute, the bass clarinet, the alto saxophone, also on the on the clarinet, on the B flat um, clarinet as well. Um, he, uh, I mean, he was a uh, he was. I guess an avant-garde jazz figure, but um, that is where he, that's what he's known for. However, he, um, that's not how his career started. He started, his first big gig was with Chico Hamilton in, in Los Angeles um, before he moved to New York and started playing with um, Charles Mingus. Um, he won a scholarship to study at USC to study music there when he was in middle school. So, I mean, he was just a, amazing, a, just an amazing musician. He died at the age of 36, um, he uh, complications uh, from diabetes in, in Paris, I believe. Um, he was in a diabetic coma and um, went into uh, shock when he was given a shot of insulin and, and died uh, at, at that young age. But um, yeah, just just an amazing, an amazing musician. Um, very influential still today and, and, and talk about someone who has a very unique voice on their, on their instrument and was supposed to be one of the kindest jazz musicians anybody could ever talk about um, and supposedly had this open door policy in his house. Anybody could come and hang out and talk about music. And um, that's the way it, that's, that's what he's remembered for. He was uh supposed to be one of John Coltrane's like only true friends as, as how he put it. Um, he played in John Coltrane's quartet uh, in the early 60s, making it a quintet. But they but he added him and he was in that group for two years, I think. Um, OK, I think we could do we could look at the next slide. Maybe. Oh, OK, yeah. Um, I know that we're running short on time. No, we're good. Um, we're I'll, good. I'll, I'll speak briefly. Uh, I mean, not out of any kind of disrespect, because this this is Miles Davis, Cannonball Adderley, and um, Jimmy Cobb. Um, Miles Davis. Uh, there's been movies made about him recently. A documentary. There was a fiction movie that came out five or six years ago. Um, he was just. Uh, he was an innovator, both in in music, um, in his stage presence, in his in his um, clothing. I mean. Uh, in, in just, just, just an amazing uh, musician and, and, and figure. Um, he, he came, he's from East St. Louis. He came from a pretty well-to-do family. His father was a dentist. Um, he did some playing in, professionally there in his late teens and moved to New York um, to, to go to Juilliard. Uh, he only lasted a year um, because he, I think he used going to school there as a way to get to New York so he could meet Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker <laughs> and, and, and hang out with them. That's how he puts it. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some, there's some, his, his autobiography is amazing. It's full of amazing stories. Um, from that time period, he talks about how he would go down to, I guess, Battery Park on the Southern tip of Manhattan and would go to the stables and ride horses. And he's he's from the Midwest and and grew up riding horses. And he said he he would do that because um, he loved riding horses, but also because he loved the looks he would get from people seeing this this young man, a young black man riding horses in the city. That not something that was was commonplace. And he did it to like shock people. That was part of it. You know, when he was 18 years old. Um, this particular picture, this group was a, a short-lived um, group. Um, he's known for having two really famous quintets. This is an interim group. However, this group recorded the most uh, best, the best-selling, hugely influential album called Kind of Blue, um, an early, it's a definitive modal jazz album. Um, and uh you have a clip do you have a clip of that i think we have time i think we have time i'm just jumping. okay yeah, I, yeah let's, um, let's do yeah, it i mean I, you can't stint on miles before before we do that the, the man there um on the left side of the picture is cannonball adderley cannonball whose real name was julian um cannonball adderley uh there's a cool story he was actually a, a band director he's from florida he was a he was like a i think a high school band director maybe even middle school um 
1955, which is the year um, Charlie Parker died, Charlie Parker is still the most influential alto saxophonist in, in jazz. Um, he died that year and um, that was Cannonball said, okay, now's my chance to, to move to New York, which is the center uh, of jazz and, and, and basically still is. And so he went there and, uh, you know, I talked about sitting in earlier. Um, also uh, on that 52nd street picture, you saw the name Oscar Pettiford on one of those marquees. He went there and had his saxophone was sitting in the audience when Oscar Pettiford was, was, um, was playing. And of course he wasn't, nobody knew who Cannonball was because he had just moved to New York. And so, you know, Oscar Pettiford was like, okay, you want to come up and play? And was kind of like, let's, you know, let's get rid of this guy. We'll, we'll play something and, you know, we'll see what he's got and whatever. And, and, and he just blew everybody away. And um, Jackie McLean, uh, uh, another alto saxophonist was a, was a Charlie Parker disciple. He supposedly just ran out of the club and ran down the street and just grabbed everyone. You you've got to come here. This saxophonist, you know, this is the new Charlie Parker is what they, <laughs> what they called him. Um, and yeah, just another, amazing musician so on the video there's a little there's an audio clip that i i just play the beginning of one of the songs from that album i play a little bit of cannonball solo and then it goes into a live video from 1959 which is the year that was recorded of another song on that album and it shows miles davis and it shows john coltrane that was john coltrane uh, of course there at the end um that was for uh, something called the sound of jazz uh a, a tv program i guess um so the next slide is this is mary lou williams um somebody who who deserves um way more um uh than she probably got in her in her lifetime um I, I would call her uh, probably, I mean, she was a virtuoso composer and pianist. Um, 
I don't know where she's from originally. I believe in her childhood was spent in um, Pittsburgh, if I if I remember, um, playing piano. I mean, as a as a child, um, playing concerts and playing professionally. Um, her first touring experience um, was she was born in 1910, so this would have been in the 20s, the, the late maybe the mid to late 1920s. She um, was touring on a circuit. Um, which was essentially playing for minstrel minstrel shows at that time period. And she, um, uh, it, there was, you know, she would do things like, um, you know, she would put dancing in, in as part of her, of, as part of her performance, spinning around on the, on the piano stool and things like that. And she met her husband there, um, whose name was John Williams, not the composer, John Williams, another John Williams. And uh, he uh, encouraged her, to just play and not, you know, not do uh, all the, um, I don't know, the, the, the shtick. And so she, um, she started taking her, the actual music more uh, seriously. She already had the, the ability um, and uh, kind of her first break outside of that. Um, it was, it's not such a great story. I mean, it's a good story. It's, it's not a, it's, it's a tragic story, but she, um, <clears throat> Her, her, her husband was playing um, for, uh, I'm trying to remember the name, it was a, there was a, a territory band. Territory bands were bands that were not well known that would, uh, would play in the Midwest and they would tour and do one nighters, one night, get on the, you know, in the, in the car and drive to the next place. And um, I can't remember who the band was. That's, that's a shame, but she, um, they, you know, as a female, they, they had no female musicians in the band. Um, and there was a scout from Brunswick Records, I think, uh, in Chicago, who came down to check out the band and said, um, and the pianist never showed up. It was checking out the band um, to see, you know, to see if they were worth of a record contract or to make a recording at all. And the pianist never showed up. And her husband, John Williams, was in the band and said, hey, why don't we get Mary Lou up here? And uh, some of the people protested, but she eventually played. It wasn't for the recording. And he, um, sh they got the recording contract out of that. And when the band traveled up north, um, they were in Kansas City. When they traveled from Kansas City up there to, the, um, to Chicago, they didn't take her. Um, they brought their original pianist. And um, so when they show up at the, at the recording session, the same guy was there the scout was there he, he was probably a producer and he was like where's where's mary lou williams oh we don't need her yes you do so then they, <laughs> sent, they sent for her and this is the this is the, the the tragedy here is that she was on um she was on the train the midnight train um and uh she was raped by the train conductor oh. um she was the only person on that train um she she jumped on that train and um, she she woke up to find him on top of her and she went and the first thing she did at the recording session was just improvise something. This is something that's truly amazing as a musician. She could improvise um, pieces that sounded like they, they took, you know, tons of time to compose. There's 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 form and, you know, key changes and all this stuff. And 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 that that was um, recorded and put out and it's just solo piano and it was like it was part of her um you know that experience that she had she put it into that music um and she ended up starting to write arrangements for the band and other people started buying her arrangements um she ended up uh she's she's known for being part of every genre of jazz from the 20s on she died i think in like 1978 or 1980 something like that um, and she was known for, you know, she was a huge influence on Dizzy Gillespie, Thelonious Monk, those modernists from the 1940s would come to her house and she would, she would show them harmony. I mean, she was known for that, but no one really talks about that anymore. Um, and so she did in the fifties, um, I think it was, I don't remember when it was recorded, but she had something called the Zodiac suite where she had written a piece for every sign of the Zodiac and she got her manager to um, get her a date at Carnegie Hall. And she arranged this suite for the New York Philharmonic. And 
she's she's probably the first female to do that definitely the first black female to do this but it was completely panned by critics who were classical critics who did not understand musically what was going on and i think that kind of just broke her and she she dropped out of music and was painting for for i don't know a decade maybe five years and she discovered what got her out of this was was she discovered catholicism and what got her back into music was finding a way of bringing jazz into catholicism and i and from what i have uh read um the the black community has felt musically um I don't know what the word would be underrepresented within Catholicism. And so she started writing, she would write a mass and, and just write music, but it's, it sounds like jazz. It sounds like R and B, but it's actually, it's for, it's written for, for, you know, her involvement in the, in the church. So that's the video has um, that first piano piece that she, that she improvised in, this was 1930 after taking that train ride um, uh, where, where she was assaulted up to Chicago then there's a little a bit from the zodiac, and then there's one of her a clip from the um, uh, uh, from the mass that she wrote. We should do it. <laughs> now I want to see it. Wow, you know I know her name, but I, I'm I'm a sort of a you know a jazz dilettante, really. I mean I know the the well known stuff, and it, it's a it's a damn shame that she is as under recognized as she is. I, I yeah, feel like I have my life has been deprived of her. You know? I, I feel the same. She wasn't. Um, she didn't use. Uh, you know, she she had a, a gig at this place called Cafe Society in New York, and um, she refused to flaunt her sexuality. She thought people should be there for the music, and and she lost the gig because of that. And that's likely a big part of why she's not better known aside just from being a female in a completely male dominated um music scene we have a question if we're um i hate to wrap it up because i know there's just so much to say about all of these but um we are getting close to time we do have a question that's probably more for doug was there a large market to sell jazz photos when these were taken there really was not a large market um i think that the the these photographers um like charles stewart who i who i mentioned and we we saw a bunch of charles stewart things uh, chuck stewart here um he he made a living shooting for the musicians themselves for album covers for the music industry but he's kind of the exception especially as a black photographer he he did several thousand album covers including many very famous ones so somebody like that could make a living as as you went further down the line there are 15 photographers in this exhibition and the majority of them are actually not strictly jazz photographers they're photographers who have a, a much wider range and happen to shoot some jazz photography um, or something related to jazz because it was really it was really hard. William Gottlieb, we saw a bunch of those. He he shot for Downbeat, and you know early on I I mentioned the Washington Post thing, but when he was in New York, he was hooked in. Some people some people were, but all in all, you had to have a much wider spread of photography, and some of it just happened to be jazz. So the jazz specialists were pretty rare and it was a tough go. I'm not an expert on this at all, but it, you know, that's the truth of the matter. Well, I think we're about out of time, but this has been so fascinating to hear the stories behind these photographs and really learn about um, these musicians and the photographers really brings them to life. So thank you both so much. Thank you. For being here and, um, and for everyone watching, please come see the show in person. Um, it's on view in the Culver Center. And um, thanks again, everyone. Have a great evening. Thanks, Josh. This was fun. Thank, Thank you, Doug. Thanks, Lindsay. Lindsay.